Uh, if you have a Bible, turn it over with me to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5. That is in the Old Testament. Uh, we are continuing our series uh, through the book of Ecclesiastes, calling this uh, The Good Life. I do want to mention this today. Um, Kind of give credit where credit is due in that, uh, obviously, a lot of people, sickness going around all over the place. Uh, we had a worship team of three that was supposed to uh, play this morning and lead us in worship, and two of those three got sick, so we begged a- Evan to come along, and then Abby's my wife, so she's like, I guess I have to do it still. So, uh, in fact, it was getting so desperate, I think one of them texted me and said, hey, can you want to, you want to, like, play guitar? I'm like, people don't need to hear that. That would, like turn people away, but Evan came in last minute and did that, so uh, I think he walked out, but I appreciate them jumping in last minute and doing that and leading us uh, through through worship. So again, Ecclesiastes 5, and if you have a bulletin, hopefully you got one as you walked in, I want you to use that to help uh, stay engaged, taking notes as we go through this. It's been often said... um, uh, that a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think that's true. So I figured uh, I want to give you kind of a summation of the book of Ecclesiastes. We've been in the last four weeks. This will be week number five. And I thought, well, I can show you a picture or I can show you a video that's even worth more words. And if I speak on top of that as well, that's a whole lot of words. All right. So I'm going to give you a summary of that. And I want you to just kind of watch. There's going to be something on the screen. I want you to watch as I give this summary. And so hopefully you can do two things at once, watch and listen. But uh, Solomon, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, okay? Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, uh, and he was the wealthiest man that ever lived. In fact, even if you adjust it for inflation, the richest person that lives right now, Elon Musk, whoever that is, I don't even know who the richest person is, doesn't even touch the amount of money that Solomon had. Not only did he have money, he had all the funds he could ever want as well. He he tested life in every way. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to enjoy it. And so he, wine, women, pleasures, accomplishments, he went after all those things. Uh, in today's context, we'd say sex, drugs, and, rocks and rock and roll is what he went after. And he found that a vanity. He even says it's just a chasing after the wind. And we said, and I've said that, that Solomon's kind of an enigma in parts because like wisest man that ever lived, he really gets it. He understands in part what's going on, but yet he can't always live it out. Does that sound like any of us in this room? That we understand what is right, we know what we should do, but yet we don't always live under that wisdom. He had all this wisdom, yet it did not uh, work out. He didn't take his own advice. His vision was clouded by all these other things that he was involved in, and he really couldn't see the same thing. Now, here's the thing that I think is so important, that God uses Solomon. That's part of the reason we're studying this book. Uh, God used, throughout Scripture, used animals. He uses a donkey. Uh, God uses uh, prophets. God uses kings that were wicked to do what he is going to do. And so God uses Solomon. Solomon, even though Solomon doesn't always get it right, God uses Solomon in a powerful way. The phrase under the sun is used 29 different times, and that's important. Whenever you see that phrase, if you do not understand the phrase under the sun, you will be depressed after you read this book. Even if you understand the phrase under the sun, you'll be a little depressed reading this book. But you must understand this idea of under the sun, that everything the sun touches, he is writing from that perspective. So he goes on this test to say, I'm going to try all these things, anything that is supposed to bring us value under the sun, I'm going to try all those things. And he comes to the point of saying everything under the sun is, what word does he use? Is meaningless. There you go, Tony, good job. Yeah, is meaningless. And He says it's chasing after uh, the wind. And I think it's important for us to study this because there's so many in this room that the Word of God informs your world. But there's so many in this world that that's not the case. Kind of just blindly through this world, trying to figure out which way to go. And he kind of lives that way. He's got all the resources, got all the wisdom, and he's saying, I'm going to try to find as much life in this world as possible. I'm going to try to find as much meaning apart from God, apart from eternity, everything under the sun, I'm going to do everything I can to find that meaning. And what he finds in it, is he finds out that he hates his life. He even says it's like, actually, it's cruel that he was even born. He wishes he would never was even born. That's what he feels like. And so the first four chapters, it is kind of depressing. And we kind of get this, like, it's like from Winnie the Pooh, kind of the Eeyore, that's kind of how, like, everything is meaningless, chasing after wind. You get a little excited, like, I went this direction, and wait, there was, there was nothing to, to, to that. And so what you see and kind of what we just showed up there was that video of the sand is that's kind of what the book of Ecclesiastes is. It's like, it's like writing your life in the sand. You know what happens, right? It's the same thing that happened there. The waves took it. How much time and energy was put, how much hope was put in that, but yet that water just comes through and it just all comes crashing down. That is what the point of this book is. Under the sun, life is truly 
uh, meaningless. Daryl spoke last week and he, he introduced you, maybe you already knew the concept of nihilism, but just this idea that it's like living life that there is no God or that God is dead. And living that life is, is pointless. And so it's really important for us to read this, understanding that this is how so many view our world and that we need to make sure as Christians we don't live our life in such a way that there is something so much more. We were created for something much more than just living and dying or or gaining as many things that we can in this life. There is a purpose. So the question today is going to kind of move away from the Eeyore stuff and move more towards worship. And the question today is, in your bulletin, is this, is how do you you even approach worship? Like, how do you even approach worship? That's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at through the only, I was going to do the entire book of, uh, or entire chapter of Ecclesiastes today, but I figured I would not finish it in time. So we're just going to hit the first seven verses that talks about worship. So we're going to do that today. Before we do, let's take a moment and let's pray together. Father, you are good. I thank you for uh, just this this time we have to dig into your word. Uh, Teach us. Uh, our hearts to be humble and ready to learn from you today. Uh, Thank you for even Solomon in in writing this down. And as much as a difficult time as he had understanding the the concept of it, we're on the same point at times. I thank you that these words are there for us to understand really what is the purpose of life. What does it really mean to live the good life? Lord, thank you for Jesus. It's his name we pray. Amen. Again, we talked about, uh, a couple weeks ago, we went to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 3. He even talks about this. He says in 2, 3, he says, I tried cheering myself up with wine and embracing all this folly. And he said, my mind's still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. And so he said, I've tried all these other things. I've tried everything else. Now here, I'm going to go, I'm turn to God. I'm going to turn to this religion and kind of see what that does. Because again, I've, I've gone through all these adventures in life and really came to the point of there's just a lot of meaningless. It's a chasing after the wind. What about God? And so three things I want to point out to you today as we go through this. Number one is this, don't utter praise insincerely. And sincerely. Let's look at verse 1 together. It says this, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifices of fools who do not know that they do uh, wrong. Now, a couple things in this. I want to make sure we um, define terms. When it talks about the house of God, uh, the house of God has existed for a long, long time. All right, we understand this concept here, but before that, there was a tabernacle. Maybe you know, kind of like a, a church uh, on wheels, basically. It was a big tent that they would kind of move around, and God's presence was there. And then they went to the, the temple that was, that was built by Solomon. David was, wanted to build it, but Solomon is the one that actually built it. We know from history that that temple did not last forever. In fact, it was torn down in, uh, it, after it was built uh, by all these men. It was torn down in 586 uh, uh, B.C. by the Babylonians. We know there was a second temple, built Ezra, uh, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, they built that second temple. That was eventually tore down as well. And so now what they had was they had these smaller synagogues, kind of like what we have today as far as we call these, we call it a church, okay? That's what we gather in. And obviously you know this, that uh, worship isn't just at a church. You can worship God wherever, but certainly one of the places, and there's churches all around the nation, world right now, doing exactly what we do. People from all different walks of life coming together, people that have nothing in common common, yet they're coming together to worship the name of God. And this is happening all throughout. And so as this is talking about, this is talking about people that are like pilgriming, people that are traveling to the temple and worship. I want to, I want to remind you of this, and this is really important as we, as we talk about worship. Worship, in fact, here's your blank here. Worship is living a life of respect and devotion towards God. Again, uh, I was just this weekend at a the conference uh, called Superstart. It's a CIY conference for like third through fifth graders. And there were like uh, 1,000 to 1,500 of them just yelling and screaming, and it was loud and all that. But one of the things they kept talking about is that worship can happen anywhere. And they were put, uh, just putting that thoughts in kids over and over again, and it's a reminder that worship can happen anywhere. But yet there is a time, there's a special time when we gather together. And this is what this passage is talking about. It's not just talking about 24-7 worship, because again, worship is not just relegated to 1030 on Sunday morning. We can worship God all the time in whatever we do. We can worship him. But yeah, this is this time where they are approaching the temple. They're approaching this time, this temple uh, together. In fact, uh, Psalm 51, 16 through 17, here's what it says. It says this, you do not delight in sacrifices or I'd bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a, a broken and contrite heart, God, 
you will not despise. This idea that God certainly desires our worship, but worship really should be from the uh, inside out. Not to say that you, there isn't a level where you can, you can start on the outside, but for the most part, our worship should start from here and flow out from there. And so as we sing songs, it's not about so much the songs we're singing, it's the songs of our heart. It's as we serve, we're serving from our heart. As we're conversing with others, we're doing it from our heart. That's what God desires. It's not that, if, it's not that he didn't desire sacrifices, but ultimately what he desired was our heart. That is what he wanted. And so this right here is talking about this first point is don't utter praise insincerely. It should come from our hearts. It should absolutely be uh, sincere. Now, it says this, look again at your Bibles in your first part. It says to guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Just first, before first service, we have a, a sweet widow in our church. Her name is, uh, is uh, Mary, and she was walking into uh, the service, and I uh, was standing at the door, opening the door for her in the handicap entrance, and I was saying hello to her, and I kind of caught her off guard, like it kind of scared her. All right, uh, probably the 75-year-old woman kind of scared her, and she was, it was kind of chart, was kind of took a step back, a step back. And I was like, I'm sorry to scare you. And she, what she said to me is, she's like, Oh, I was watching my steps. And I was like, Well, that goes right into my sermon today, because she was watching her steps as she was entering uh, church. Now, this guarding your steps has kind of two different meanings in this. And uh, in fact, your blank here is this: is that guarding your steps has a, both a practical and spiritual implication. The, let's start with the let's start with the practical one first. Uh, they actually this temple that was built we'll put a, we'll put it up on the screen that, that was actually uncovered the steps of them. Uh, ben, you got it up there. It's a picture up there. Thanks, sir. All right. Uh, so the steps up to up to Jerusalem. They the, the steps were different in this way. Is that if you if as they uncovered it in the 1960s, what they found is the steps were at different uh, different sizes. So in fact, the, the what they found was this: is that one of the steps was uh, 35 inches, and then another one, the next one was 12, and, and somewhere in between that. And then the height was seven to ten inches tall. So as you can imagine, as you would climb up the stairs of the temple, you had to guard or you had to really watch your step. Otherwise, if you don't watch your step, what would happen? You'd fall. Now, around here, if we had, we don't have that many steps entering in. We got a couple steps as you enter in uh, the front doors here. If we had steps and they were different height and they were different length, we would think that's not very good craftsmanship. We would think uh, like Jerry Culp is falling asleep at the wheel, right? He would not be okay with that. But what we find is part of the reason, this is brilliant, Part of the reason they did this is because the people uh, that were the Levites, those that were in charge of the temple, they did this for a purpose because they didn't want people to walk casually into the temple. In part, they wanted them to watch their steps. They didn't want them to just go about their lives. They wanted them to take, watch each and every steps, be thinking as they're, as they're entering into worship. It had nothing to do with poor uh, craftsmanship. It was, it was, it was very uh, deliberate. And, you know, at that point in life, uh, there, as they were worshiping there, I'm sure their lives are busy. Our lives are busy as well, right? And we're all busy. And it's really easy as we approach worship. Oh, this is another thing. I've got to check it off my list. But there's a part of us that whenever we enter the doors uh, of, this, of church or of, of coming together, that it is, it's a holy time. It's a holy time. Like we gather, and how much thought do we put into it? How much thought do we even put into it before we come here, or is it just another thing we do on our list? I think there's part of it, the practical implication is this, is that we guard, our, uh, we guard it and then our hearts as well. That is the, that's the more practical aspect of it, is that there is absolutely the idea that we need to, we need to guard our steps uh, from a, a practical, but we also need to guard it from a spiritual standpoint, because it's easy just to walk in the doors, walk in and out, and it's just another thing that we do. You know, we, we can not guard our steps by this, is that we could be on the way to church and driving down 159, and we're driving down 159 to get here, and that really, really slow driver is going down the road. You know the one I'm talking about, right? And we give them, we're frustrated, and they won't get out of our way, and we give them a not-so-kind uh, hand signal on the way there, right, on the way to church. None of you would do that, but other churches, I've heard people do that, right? <laughs> but the crazy part is this, is with that same hand that we're giving some of that signal, we're worshiping God with that same hand. Same thing with our, with our mouse. We might yell at the person or yell at our family or whatever those things are. And there's not a lot of thought. 
There is a part of us that calls us to guard our steps because we know Satan is alive and active. He's going to do whatever he can to get our minds, get our hearts off that, off of what God has to, to teach us today. So there's this level where, where as we approach, we need to do it very intentionally. We need to do it. Now, there, there's two sides of the coin of this. I want, to, I want to read this quote. I shared this on Facebook not that long ago, and uh, I really like this. This was from uh, somebody, uh, Philip Yancey, who's a writer. He had an alcoholic friend, and he's what his friend said to him. He said this. He said, when I'm late to church, people turn around and stare at me with frowns of disapproval. Now, I think this is a bit hyperbole. I don't think that happens around here all that often. I don't, I don't see that. But it says, I get the clear message, and I, but I still love his point, that I'm not responsible as they are. When I'm late to AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, the meeting comes to a halt and everyone jumps up to hug me and welcomes me. They realize that my lateness may be a sign that I almost didn't make it. When I show up, it proves that my desperate need for them won out over my desperate need for alcohol. So on the one side of the coin, let me say this. If you're, I, I, there have been people who said to me, I was going to come to church, but I knew I was going to be late. Here's, I want you to hear me loud and clear. Come late. It's okay. Like, come late to church. That is totally okay. We want you here. We want you here and we're not judging. We understand life happens. Now, there's the opposite side of the coin, and that's particularly, for, especially for newer people in that, but there's the opposite side of the coin, of that preparing ourselves for worship, to be ready uh, for that and what God's going to do. You know, there's a, there's a big game today. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. There's like this Super Bowl thing, right, that's happened in Las Vegas, and like, I know the Chiefs are playing. I don't see anybody else rooting for the other team, but the, the Chiefs are nowhere of playing. I've seen like seven or eight shirts today saying they're playing today. Here's what I know. I know those tickets are like seven to $10,000, which is just astronomical, and those aren't even for like really, really great seats, all right? Here's what I know about those people. I don't know them, but I guarantee you they will not be late for the game, right? They won't be late for the game. In fact, most of them came multiple days in advance, and they will come early, and they'll tailgate, all right? And so they'll do all kinds of crazy things. They'll grill out. They'll, I'm sure they'll be drinking who knows what. They'll be play, throwing around the football. They'll be, they'll be laughing, having a good old time before it. There will not be anybody late for that game. Now, I've been uh, working in the church in a, in a pastoral role almost 20 years now. I have never, ever, ever seen anybody tailgating for church. I've never seen somebody out there with a Budweiser in their hand and a brat in the other hand and say, man, I can't wait for the sermon today. It's going to be a doozy today. I've never seen it. Maybe it happens in other churches. It doesn't happen here. Maybe, maybe more PG uh, for us. Maybe it's a, a donut and a coffee or whatever. But I, people don't do that. But there is a level where I think we should. We should be ready. We're worshiping the God of this universe. And, and, and to plan, I, I've, I've heard this phrase, and it, it may be a few uh, slides in advance, uh, Ben, but the, the phrase that Sunday morning church is a Saturday night decision. You know, I, I was challenged with that years ago, the idea of like reading myself. And so, like, believe it or not, on Saturday night, I have routines that I want to make sure that I'm ready on Sunday morning. I actually pick out my clothes on Saturday night so I don't have to think about it on Sunday morning because there's a whole lot of other things going on. We try to get things done around here, and that's a true story, but we try to get things done around here. I say it all the time to Lindsay, like, we don't want Sunday mornings to be stressful. They are stressful because life happens and people get sick and things happen, but we don't want Sundays, we want to work hard during the week so Sundays we can just, we can actually, like, practice the presence of God being a in his presence, and just focus on worshiping him. That is absolutely what we want to do. And so there's a part of us that, yes, you can wake up on Sunday morning. Maybe some of you guys did that. But I would really encourage you to start saying, hey, Saturday night, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there on time. I'm going to be there ready. Get things ready beforehand so you know. Even get your coffee pod in its place so you can just hit that button ready to go or put it on a timer so you can be here ready in time and ready to worship God. There's both parts of that coin, but there is a part of this passage that says guard your steps. So kind of be wide, wise with your steps when you go to the house of God. And then the part that I think we need to catch as well, it says, and then go and listen. We, we like to talk a lot. We like to say all these things that we, we do and how many good things we do, but ultimately what he says is here is we go in there and listen. And it says, rather than uh, to offer the sacrifice of fools, so go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. We'll get to that idea in a minute. What is this idea of sacrifice of fools? But I was thinking, in fact, uh, Scott Cheatham was teaching. He was here in first service, but he was teaching on Wednesday night. Uh, we have our men's class uh, that is talking about uh, pr our prayer life, and then we have our women's class that's talking about sharing your faith. still not too late to jump into those classes uh, on Wednesday night, 6.30. But um, 
Scott was talking about uh, the, the story in 1 Kings chapter 18. Many of you guys know that story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And there's these, these 450 prophets of Baal. And they're basically, these Israelites are kind of torn between the true God, Yahweh, and, they're, and between these false gods. And they don't know totally what to do in this situation. So they're kind of torn back and forth. And there's this competition, right? We love competition. So they have this competition. Like basically, who can call down fire from heaven? And we know that uh, the prophets of Baal had the first chance. And they did it for like some morning until noon. And we know what they did during this. They're like, they are, they're doing all kinds of crazy things. They're, they're like cutting themselves. They're screaming. Elijah's kind of taunting them saying, well, maybe your God is like in the restroom right now. Maybe he's relieving himself. So maybe you need to re- uh, yell louder. And so they're doing all this, trying to catch the attention. And guess what happens? Nothing happens. Nothing happens. And then Elijah's like, well, it's my turn. Actually, it's not my turn. It's God's turn. And so we know from the text, it won't be in your screen, but we know from the text, 1 Kings 18, 36, it says, at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed. He said, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice. And so there's this part of us that we as we talk about, it says go near and listen rather than offer these sacrifice of fools, which is, we're going to see is, is just all these words. God's more interested in our hearts than he is our words. There are, there are people, and I don't, I don't totally get it, but there's people that I'll meet from time to time that who, who almost like want to show me their spiritual resume. Like I've done all these things and all this, and, and like part of me is like, it's wonderful, but ultimately, who am I? Like, you don't need to impress me. You're, if you're trying to impress me, you're impressing the wrong person. It doesn't matter. Like, what, what Scripture desires is that contrite heart, that, that person who's, who's not about themselves or not a, this, a sacrifice of fools, which is all these words and saying, God, I'm going to do this, and God, I'm going to do that, and God, listen to all these things I've done for you. It's none of those things. It's quite opposite. And so there's a part of us that you're going to see in chapter, uh, in verse 2, that talks about letting our, our words be few. Um, there's a, a prayer that Jesus teaches. Uh, we won't look into it, but you can write in your notes, Matthew 6, 5 through 8, when he talks about how we should pray, and we should pray a specific way, and not in a way that is going to draw attention to us. The attention should be drawn to God. He is the one that should be, be praising. I, I've been to enough prayer meetings. There's times I, I go to prayer meetings, and I was actually as a studying this week. There's a, a, a preacher by the name of J. Edwin Orr. He said this. He said he, sometimes it drives me crazy to go to prayer meetings, and one of the things he said, there's some people that just like to pray a long, long time. And he said sometimes it feels like it's about them. And he said the first minute, three minutes, people will pray with them. Then the next three mi- minutes, uh, people will pray for them. And then the last three minutes, they'll pray against them. All right? Is his joke on that. There, there's this level where sometimes it, it's a sacrifice of fools. Like, why are we even doing it? Are we doing it to impress uh, others? Or are we really offering this to God? Habakkuk 2.20 says it this way, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. He is God. We are not. Uh, James 1.22, do not literally listen, listen to the word, and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. So let's go to this next part. Number two is don't utter the prayers, uh, don't utter prayers impulsively. Impulsively is your next point. Listen to verse two through three. It says, do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. I love this line here. God, he is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. He says, a dream comes when there are many cares, and many words mark the speech of a fool. This, uh, this idea of quick with your mouth, again, it's, it's this, this concept that happened in the Old Testament, still happens today, that people would try to impress God, impress others with all these words and all these vows and all these things that, like this spiritual language and these big church words and trying to impress, and it's like that's not what God desires, Again, what he desires is this contrite heart. What he desires is this, is this worship. And so sometimes religion can turn into a bit of a charade, can it? Like we know all the right words, we know the, what the right things to say, and, and that's not what it's about at all. And it says this idea, it, it says God is in heaven and you are on earth. Part of that is a distance idea that God is in heaven and we are here all on earth. Uh, but I think it's even more understanding who he is and who we are. That God is supreme. He is above all. He's majestic. And we are, as believers, we are his children. And I think we need to recognize that. 
You know, it, I, we were having this conversation not that long ago, but in, in Scripture, there's kind of this, uh, it, it, there's kind of both sides of it. In one end, uh, we are called friends by Jesus, which is a pretty incredible statement. In fact, whenever the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders called uh, Jesus a friend of sinners, they were using that at, as a knock. They were using that as a way to uh, kind of make him less. But he actually calls us friend. But the other aspect of it is that he is our Lord and Savior. You know, I said a few weeks ago, he's not, he's not our homeboy. You know, he's not my buddy. He calls me friend. But he is my Lord and Savior. And so there's this reverence, I think, at times that we certainly can, can lose. That, that God is God and, and, and we are not. And when we enter into a time of worship, and again, I understand worship is 24-7, but especially in this time, there should be this recognition like, uh, I'm ready to worship the creator and God of all the universe who is worthy of, of praise and who is worthy of honor. And whatever I have going on pales in comparison to what I'm doing right now. And so there should be that recognition. There should be that holy awareness as we enter into that. And that doesn't mean like, and we could take that way too far. We can be like, well, that means that we shouldn't have coffee in the sanctuary. Well, no, that's not true because we know coffee is like, you know, it's a good thing, right? It's, it's from God, all right? Um, true, yeah. Um, I don't think that's what it means. Again, I'm glad we have like stains around the church and stuff because like I want people here. And if you have people, it's going to be messy. Like there's that aspect of it. So it's not like we don't ever run in the church. or that, That's not what it's talking about. But it's coming with a heart prepared. And again, it's very easy to focus on the outward things, but really what our desire is, it should be, is, am I, is my heart ready to worship him? Am I ready to do that? And what we ought to be doing is readying ourselves in whatever way possible, ready to come each and every week, each and every time, or what, well, on Wednesday night, or whatever it is when you're gathering, your small group, whatever it may be, that we, that we are ready, saying, God, I'm ready to hear from you. Putting aside as many distractions as possible. Satan's going to do what he's going to do. But putting aside as many distractions to be able to hear from him. Because what he has to say is more important than what we have uh, of our, uh, on ourselves. Now, going back to this friend and savior thing. There's this quote from A.W. Tozer in the book, Knowledge of Holy, which is a, a fantastic resource. Here's what he writes. He said, I think it might be demonstrated that almost every heresy that has afflicted the church throughout the years has arisen from believing about God things that are not true or from overemphasizing emphasizing certain uh, true things so as to obscure other things equally true. To magnify any attribute to the exclusion of another is to head straight uh, for one of the dismal swamps of theology, and yet we are constantly tempted to do just that. And so I think with this whole idea, uh, I have in your, uh, your uh, bulletin the hymn, uh, 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 Jesus is my, not Jesus is my friend, that's not the one, that's a, that's a different song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, which is a fantastic hymn. But yet we also sing, the song, Holy, Holy, Holy. Are both of those hymns true? Yeah. We do have a friend in Jesus, but yet he is holy. And so that both of them are true statements, but we need to make sure that we, we aren't just taking it to one side where he's just my buddy, he's my pal, and all that. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. And we need to recognize him as such and have this awe and reverence. And I think even though Solomon didn't totally get it, he understood looking around this world that there's something more and that God is worthy to be honored and uh, praise, which is why so many times, like, again, and I, I hear it all the time, I, the times I even hear around here, people just taking the, uh, like, curse words don't bother me all that much, but especially when people take the Lord's name in vain bothers me greatly. It, because that, that's God's name. There is no higher name than that. Leave him out of it if you're going to, leave him to, completely out of that. His name is to be honored and praised, and I think at times, and our desire uh, to, to not be like a high church or anything like that, sometimes we miss the awe and reverence that God so deserves. He is God, we are not. He is in heaven, we are not. And that, that's so important for us to understand. And I think Solomon is, while he doesn't totally get it, I think he's getting to that point today. And what I think we've seen in our world is we've seen a different response to it. We've kind of gone more towards uh, progressive Christianity. And maybe you're not familiar, and there's a lot of names I could throw out there, but progressive Christianity, and you might be thinking, oh, I'm a progressive Christian. I have solar panels in my house, or I have an electric car. That's not what progressive Christianity means. Uh, progressive Christianity is basically taking away the historical views of Christianity. And so we see it all the time. We see people who, uh, the resurrection, take that away. Or the, how many Christians today, and I don't even know, I've seen different Pew Research polls or Barna polls that suggest how many Christians today don't actually think Bible is the highest authority. Or it's kind of like the cafeteria Bible. Well, I like this passage, but I don't like this passage. And we pick and choose what we want in it. And like, that's not how we're to handle Scripture. 
We're to, we're to try to figure out exactly, try to learn through, uh, through study, through the Holy Spirit's guidance in our life, what it meant to the original hearers, and then we apply that into our life because we think the precepts, we think the commandments in Scripture, we think the way God wants us to live is so much greater than what this world has to teach us to live. And so we, that is what we're doing. And what progressive Christianity does is it denies all those things. It changes the view of marriage. It's not what, what the Bible teaches about marriage. It's what we think marriage should look like because we become the highest authority. And time after time, uh, let me, a couple names uh, that I'll use, uh, Rob Bell was one. He was one that I used to, I thought Rob Bell, I, I traveled with a group of guys once to hear him speak in Indianapolis. He now works for Oprah. I don't even know what he believes anymore. He kind of believes his own thing. There's another one that you may not be aware of, but is actually, uh, he's the number one, uh, was at one point the number one author on Amazon under Christian books was Richard Rohr. Uh, some of you guys might know that name. Let me show you what Richard Rohr believes. Let me, this is the introduction of, of one of his books. He says this, I dedicate this book to my beloved 15-year-old black lab, Venus, whom I uh, released and ended up passing away. And then here's what it says, without any apology, light, weight, theology, or fear of heresy, I can appropriately say that Venus was also Christ for me. And I've got buddies that I went to Bible college with that are posting his garbage and this kind of stuff. And really what he's saying is, is like he's kind of a, he's a universalist. He thinks everybody, first of all, everybody goes to heaven. And he also thinks like, well, kind of doesn't deny Jesus, but looks around that chair, uh, this, this Bible, you know, uh, that person over there, like we are all Jesus. And Jesus is kind of everywhere in that way. And what that does is that lessens the name of Jesus when what we should be doing is raising the name of Jesus. That's what we should be doing, not lessening his influence. We should be, we should be raising his influence, and that's what we see. Where, so it's not that Jesus, uh, I am Jesus, you are Jesus, everyone is Jesus, and that's kind of where he ends up in his writings. And so many Christians are falling into that because it's progressive or it sounds, it sounds a lot better. It makes uh, more sense to them. And so that's why it's important to know what you believe and, and why you believe and, and really who you believe in. And so this idea, uh, again, going back to verse 1, it talks about this idea of, of giving sacrifice to fools. And a lot of that is saying these impressive things before God or saying these impressive things out loud, making these vows before God. Maybe some of you guys have done this, like handshake deals with gods, where you're like, okay, God, if you give me this job, I'm going to stop, I don't know, name it, drink it. I'm going to stop drinking, all right? And then you get the job, and then what do you do? You're like, well, I'm going to go to the bar and drink, all right? Or you're like, God, if, if you do this, I will dedicate my life and I will, teach, I will teach junior high Sunday school for a year. And then you get that job and they're like, oh, I don't know about junior high. Maybe I'll be a greeter at the door or something else like that. I don't think I really should do that. Somebody else more. You know, you understand what I'm saying? We do those things with God. And what he's saying, that's, that's foolishness. All these words, they don't mean anything. Really what God desires is our heart in this, in, in, in this. It's generally unwise to make these type of vows. In fact, Scripture says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And then verse 3 talks about this, a, a dream, and kind of doubles down on this. A dream comes when there are many cares. And he's not really trying to get into like this hyper-analysis of, of our dreams and, and trying to understand this. But their idea is that when you have a lot on your mind, your, your dreams are pretty crazy, aren't they? Like, there's some wild dreams we have, and I don't think we'll fully understand until heaven, like, and even if we'll care at that point, but, like, our dreams are just, are just strange, the different dreams we have. And it's this idea, and many words also, just like it leads to kind of some craziness in our life, many words mark a fool as well. So a hyperactive mind can produce these wild dreams, and a hyperactive mouth can produce these just foolish uh, words, which leads to the last point. Don't, uh, don't utter praise impetuously. I had to find another word that starts with the I, so I wanted to finish it off this way. And uh, really kind of, the, it means very similar to impulsively, uh, just there's more negative connotations of this one. And this, one, this passage you may, out of this entire chapter in chapter uh, five, you may know these words. Here's what it says. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to, than to make one and not fulfill it. You should probably underline that passage. Verse 6, do not do not let your mouth lead you into sin and do not protest uh, to the temple messenger. My vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. Therefore, fear God. Now, again, we, we don't generally like commitments. 
And, and we're so quick even to making these commitments to God, like how quickly do we, or how quickly do we abandon those? Even that passage is talking about, we talking about like temple priests and we convince ourselves, well, did I really say this or did I really mean this? And we just don't like keeping vows. I mean, think of marriage itself. I mean, uh, half of marriage is in a divorce, and that includes in church as well. We don't necessarily like keeping our, our, our vows, uh, we, vows to him of committing our lives to him as Lord and Savior of our life. How quickly we are like, well, I did when I was younger, and now I'm not so sure. That's why it's not, in general, a wise idea to give vows. Again, instead, saying your yes be yes and your no be no. There's something to this, and I don't know, but the, the name of God is mentioned um, about, I think, 41 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. In this chapter alone, in these first seven verses, I think it was six or seven times, there's something that's really interesting that I found in this, and I'm not, I'm not totally sure we can, um, we can assume this, but I'll say it preaches well, and I think there's something, there probably is something to this. Whenever the word uh, God is used in that, if, you may or may not know this, but particularly in the Old Testament, there's 21 different names used for the name of God, and usually that speaks to a part of his character. Well, Elohim, uh, which, is, which is actually a plural world, which is the idea of our triune God, talks about this idea of him being creator, mighty, strong. It's used 40 or 41 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. The Yahweh that term, Yahweh, or, or in your blank here, Jehovah, is used zero times. And Jehovah, whenever it's used, actually it's used way more times in Scripture than the word Elohim, used way more times. But whenever that word is used, whenever Jehovah or is used in Scripture or Yahweh, it's talking about a personal relationship. It would not be unfair to assume in this in a large part, he's writing this, and he's writing this from a perspective of somebody who is a wise person who's trying to teach others, but yet he himself, all right, I hope you're with me, doesn't necessarily have that relationship with him. So he's almost writing without, he, he has a great knowledge of God, but he doesn't really know him. Again, it, it's not about when you get to heaven, it's not about a Bible trivia contest. How many books of the Bible can you name? Can you name in order? Can you spell these books? It's nothing like that. It's did you not know about God, but did you know him? That's what it's about. Did you know, uh, did you know Jesus? And, and there's a part of me that wonders in, in reading this, is that if he knew a lot about God, but he didn't really know God, which is, makes it kind of sad. He ends it in this verse. He says, therefore fear God. I think he genuinely believed fear in God, and we should fear God. But yet, I think this was more of, instead of a, uh, he's looking at him as a master, which, again, he is truly our master. That is true. But this relationship as a friend, I think he missed. This relationship of somebody who, who, who died for him, I think he missed that idea, that close relationship with him. So this idea of we shouldn't make, uh, we shouldn't make these promises that we don't intend on keeping, that's why we do not we shouldn't make vows. I, um, I remember uh, a time that I was, uh, I was a youth minister for a lot of years, and I took the kids to an event called uh, Winter Jam. I don't know if any of you guys have ever been to it. They still have it uh, today. It was at the Family Arena that year. It was one of the first years that they had it at the Family Arena. And I remember, uh, I'll, I'll call her Carrie because some people in this room might actually know who she is. Uh, she was in the middle school group, and at the end of the night, uh, one of the bands comes out, and they kind of do an altar call, and they usually lead you towards three different commitments. Either you want to make a, a decision for the Lord, you want to, you need prayer, or you want to rededicate your life, or you want to go into full-time Christian service. And so here we are, an arena full of 12, 13,000 people, and we're all singing together and everything, and one of these middle school girls uh, from my group decides to go forward. And there's a part of me, and, and this is going to sound so weird from co coming from a preacher, but I hope you hear my heart in this idea. Whenever kids uh, or whenever teenagers or even I would say adults as well make decisions for the Lord at those kind of events, I, I squirm a little bit because oftentimes they're making emotional decisions that they spiritually can't keep up with. Does that make sense? Like in the height of it, the music loud, uh, there, there's calling for this. You come up and talk to the band. You come backstage. What middle schooler wouldn't want to do that? You know, and so here this girl, Carrie, ends up going down up front. And, uh, I, and that also made me nervous because I'm like, I have no idea where she's going. I'm here, and I've got other kids going up front as well. And, and so trying to kind of manage all of them was a nightmare. But that's a totally different side point. And so here I am standing there, and about 20 minutes later, as they're still doing on it and trying to handle all these kids, she walks, Carrie walks back up. And I said, hey, what, what happened? And she's like, oh, uh, the line was too long, and so I decided to come back. And I remember thinking at, at that point, you know, there was a part of her, and I don't know why she was originally drawn to go forward. 
I don't know if it's because she saw her buddies go forward. I don't know if it's because she felt like I want to impress the people around me or I want to impress my youth leaders. I don't know what it was. But there was something in her that she, the vow that she wanted to commit, she was not ready to make that emotional decision to, to follow her spiritual decision to, uh, to follow what she was going to do. And so that is kind of what this passage is, is really getting to, is letting your words be few. God's way more interested in your heart. God's more, way more interested in what you have to, uh, to offer him as a sacrifice of the heart, not as a sacrifice of words. Words are cheap. The, today, again, being Super Bowl Sunday, it's really easy to talk a good, good game. I know lots of people who can talk a good game. It's another thing to be obedient towards him, to do what God has called. And, and, and Solomon, who didn't totally get it all, who didn't live it all outright by any stretch of the imagination, he understood he understood this idea that if I'm going to make a commitment to the Lord, it needs to be something that I'm taking very, very seriously. I'm going to approach God's throne very, very cautiously and very, uh, very, very uh, seriously because I understand he is God, I am not. I'm the worship team, come on forward. I want to read one more passage to you. This is from John 4. This is the passage of the woman at the well. And, and they're having this conversation, and, and this woman's trying to hide her life from Jesus. Jesus knows she's been married multiple times, and she's kind of an out, outsider. She's going to the middle of the day to the well to draw, uh, draw water. He knows all that about her. She's trying to hide. She's probably embarrassed by it. And Jesus offers her something. Look at John 4, 13 through 14. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water, talking about this earthly water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling into this eternal life. And so for some of us today, as we read through the book of Ecclesiastes, um, what he's saying is this, this physical water we drink, like what we have on a daily basis, it, it's not going to fill us. There's something so much greater, and God wants to give that to us. And so as we approach him, we see him as the God of the universe who cares enough for us to send his son, Jesus, to die. So if you've never accepted him, if you've never uh, brought him in as Lord and Savior of your life, we'd love to talk to you about what that means, what this idea of belief means, what it means to have a saving uh, faith, what it means to trust in him, what it means to repent, what it means to be baptized. We're going to have four baptisms in just a minute. We want to talk about what it means to do that, what it means to make that commitment to him, to say, I'm going to live for you. There's others that, that just may need prayer, uh, that, you, that you're struggling through uh, just some difficulties. You're even struggling through, like, I, this religio religiosity thing, I'm kind of I'm doing it. Like, I want this to be from my heart. I want this to be so real. I want this to be so true. And so maybe you just need prayer well, some prayer support people. If you want to come up here, kneel and pray, we'd love to have you do this. Or if today uh, you need a church home, man, we'd love to invite you in. We're imperfect, but we follow a perfect Savior. So we have this time of invitation. Would you come as we stand and we sing together?